we are going to dive into Bob's life a little bit today um, and tell you why, or he's going to tell you why, um, he got into the firearm industry. So, with that, why did you get into the firearm industry? No, I guess it was a passion. Um, you know, everybody, hopefully in their life, has some type of passion. Mine was more mechanical. I always liked to build things and make things and, and uh, ever since I was a kid. So, it, it, you know, it, it started out real young, you know, actually my, my dad was a hunter, um, always had firearms around the house, and uh, I was very interested in those, you know, we had very strict rules in the house, you know, um, my dad didn't have to lock up any of the guns, you know, back then, I mean, I was born in 63, so mm -hmm. as I grew up in the garage, I mean, the garage door would be open, there'd be guns sitting on a... Uh, you know, on a gun rack right in the right in the garage, and nobody messed with them because you just knew that that wasn't going to be the thing to do. It was going to be a bad day for you if you touched something <laughs> you weren't supposed to. So, you know, we we stayed. But then my dad would allow. He would take us out. You know, me and sometimes some of my friends, and uh, we go. My uncle's farm was close to where we lived. It actually, some of his property bordered just up the road from where we lived, and. Um, I was real fortunate when I was younger. Um, uh, my uncle had a dairy farm, which he had about 900 acres uh, mm -hmm. in two different areas. And so we hunted a lot. We, we went out target shot a lot. I, I spent tons of time just sitting on the mountains looking and groundhog hunting when I, I got older and I could actually uh, take the firearms out myself. And where was that at? Uh, actually, in New Jersey, Hamburg, New Jersey, which is the uh, northern part of New Jersey, which is kind of a bedrock uh, community of, if you want to call it New York City. I mean, it still yeah. takes you about 45 minutes to get to New York City or so, but... Now um, they don't allow guns. Yeah, they, right. You can't <laughs> hardly find a gun anywhere. Um, and that's what, it's funny, because a lot of people refer to, it like, New Jersey as, like, Beirut, you know? And yeah. But back when I was a kid, it was all farmland up there. Um, it was all farmland, and it was... Uh, a great area. Most everybody, when we grew up, um, were interested in, in either hunting or outdoors or something like that. So it was kind of just natural to me to take that path. And um, because I was always kind of mechanical and liked to tinker with things, uh, as I grew up, I, I started working on on different firearms, sporterizing mm -hmm. rifles and uh, reloading uh, my own ammunition and all types of things like that. Um, my first firearm I ever really uh, worked on quite a bit was a was a, a old 6.5 Jap from World War II that That's my sweet. uncle brought back yeah. yeah and he gave it to me and it wasn't really an expensive gun or anything but um, I redid the firearm actually twice and uh, I, I made it to go groundhog hunting at mm -hmm. my uncle's farm one of the thing was you know um, clearing out groundhogs why because they dig a lot of holes the cows break their leg you got a two thousand dollar cow that's hamburger meat now so you know you, you you they don't want groundhogs around so and they're kind of pesky and you have them all over so yeah. me and my buddies would go over there and, and hunt groundhogs and actually during hunting season hunt ducks and everything else yeah that's funny that you say that because i used to go out with my buddy that had a farm oh and, really yeah we would shoot 22s at wild boars oh really yeah okay. they, they had a pig farmer like that lived right next to him and they like, I don't know how, but there was a bunch of wild pigs that got out mm -hmm. and they just like tore through their fence and they were just running everywhere. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, they, they'll root everything up and make a big mess of things sometimes, depending on the guy's farm. But, um, and as I, as I grew up, I worked on my uncle's farm, I bailed hay, I worked with the cows, I fed cows, everything else. And so that was kind of my lifestyle back then, you know, today that's, that's all gone and, and, uh, um, you know it's actually a golf course now so but but uh, you know that's this progress in that area you know everything's built up around that area so there isn't as much hunting or anything um but back then you know it, it was a whole different time in history um firearms were just like part of the culture at that time you know yeah. it, was, it was it was just as much as you buying a pair of sunglasses or anything else everybody bought a firearm it seemed everybody wanted to educate themselves on, on firearms and, and you know some people didn't get into it deeply they didn't have huge interest in it um, but there was a huge percentage of people that did you know yeah. and and it was more for the outdoors and, and those type of things um, but as I, I got closer um, into high school I didn't really know I wanted to do it in my life I, 
I mean, I think everybody gets to that point in your life where you're kind of confused and you're you're like, oh my, what, what you know, I, I'm going to graduate in two or three years here. What am I going to do with my life? You know, and at least I was. A lot of people maybe they don't care, but me, I was like, what am I going to do with my life? I still feel like I'm like that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but so as I as I as I transformed into high school a little bit. Um, one of my shop teachers, you know, actually, you know, I talked to my parents a lot. I counseled the people around the area, mm -hmm. and and one person told me to go and talk. I, I always had a big interest in gunsmithing. You know, I was always yeah. tinkering with guns, taking them apart, trying to refine them, make stocks, all these things. And one person said, "Well, there's a couple, three gunsmiths in the area. Why don't you go and talk to them and mm -hmm. you know see if see what see what they say about their life and maybe that's the way you want to go, you know." Yeah. And gunsmithing is kind of a, a strange thing to get into. Even back then, you didn't see a whole lot of people, you know, yeah. other than for hobbyists saying, well, I'm, I'm going to be a gunsmith. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I know anyone besides you that's yeah. a gunsmith. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, you know, in, in my realm, I, I know quite a few people because that's what I do every day now. Yeah. But back then, it's even then, it was scarce. Now mm -hmm. it's even more scarce yeah. today. Um, so, it, you know, I talked to some gunsmiths in the area. And one of the biggest common factors I found with all the gunsmiths is they all said that they wish they would have went for further education. Yeah. Most of them were just high school educated, which there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong yeah. with that at all. There's but, a lot of billionaires that are high school. Oh yeah, educated. exactly, exactly. <laughs> but a lot of them all said they wish they would have had like more engineering and like like more about uh, materials, yeah. heat treatments, things like that. Because they just when they got into actually having to make something, develop something for a product. So you got a broken firing pin. Well, what material do you use? How do you heat treat it? What's, you know, you don't just like whip it out a piece of metal and okay, it works. That's not yeah. the way things go. So, so they all had that same, they all had different paths. They all had different likes and dislikes, but they all seem to have the same common denominator of they needed, they all desired a little bit more education to really be what they really wanted to be, not just replacing parts or, yeah. you know, fixing things every day, actually being able to develop the product a little bit further. So at that point, I actually went to the high school guidance counselor and I said, hey, you know what I do? And and they gave a few schools that I should look at for colleges. And um, at that same exact time, um, I took a lot of shop classes. You know, when I was in my junior and senior year, I had most of my credits that I needed, so I had like half a day almost, you know, in my yeah. senior year where I didn't have to do a whole lot. So I, you know, got good friends with our shop teacher because I used to hang out there all the time. He knew I really had a desire for it. Uh, his name is Mr. Kish, and he actually made muzzleloaders right in, in the school, okay? <laughs> You'd never see that now. No, never, <laughs> never. Okay, so, so I asked Mr. Kish, I said, you know, do you mind if I... And he knew I had a good desire for doing these mm -hmm. things. And he said, do you mind if I come and, and work on guns in the shop class with you on my off times? And he didn't, I mean, you know, today you wouldn't even get permission for that. You'd be yeah, a felon. absolutely not. Yeah, you'd yeah. be a felon. But back then, he didn't even have to, like, talk to the principal or anything. Yeah. Because, there, you know, kids bring guns to school all the time back then. I mean, you know, there, we kids would go squirrel hunting during the day and, leave their guns in their lockers in the afternoon and go home with them at night, yeah. you know? We had rifle teams in the school, you know? Um, so, and Mr. Kish said, okay, he said, yeah, I'll let you work on your, your firearms here, that's fine, but you're gonna do exactly the way I tell you, or you're not gonna be here, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, and he, he said, well, what do you wanna start on first? I said, well, you're doing muzzleloaders, and Mr. Kish, he was an unbelievable craftsman, Unbelievable craftsman. He would actually, you know, buy all the components, no kits, just buy all the components, the, 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 the stocks, he would actually replicate, like he would look at a certain vintage of, of a, say a Kentucky rifle for some type of vintage of just like certain section of, the, of, the, of that state that they used to build there and then try to replicate it. He would actually go and cut down a tree and then slab saw the wood, and then come in and band saw out after it was dry enough, and, and band saw out and actually hand hewn the whole stock. That's crazy. Yeah, that's, insane. That, yeah, that's... insane. So, so I told him, I said, well, I, I want to start with a muzzleloader, and I like to hawk, and I want to do a hawk. And so I bought a kit, I bought a Thompson Center kit. And he said, okay. He said, uh, 
that, that's a nice project for you to start with. You know, at my stage, you know, you're in high school. It's not like you're a super craftsman yet or anything. You know, you're, you're, you're lucky you're not stumbling over your own sneakers half the time. So, so he said, uh, okay, so let's start. And he goes, okay, all those screws in your kit, get rid of them. Other than the lock screw, I said, what do you mean? I said, how am I going to put this stuff together? How am I going to put the rib on the bottom of the octagon barrel? How am I going to get the barrel the way it has to be? How am I going to put the eyelets in here? I said, it calls they're using all these screws. He's like, you're going to do it the way they did it in the old fashioned days. You're going to hand file everything in. And then after you hand file everything in, you're going to actually tin both sides and German silver solder everything on this gun. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't know how to German silver solder. I, my hand skills are pretty good, but I don't know how I'm going to be able to file all these eyelets in and hand file this barrel and everything. Yeah. But he said, hey, you want to stay here and do this? You're going to do it the way I told you. And I remember we established that right from the beginning. And I said, well, I said, okay, I, I understand. And I'll do exactly what you say. So instead of me being able to put together a kit and have it produced in a couple days and done, I worked for like weeks on this thing. Yeah. And I put tons of hours into it and, and buffing the brass on everything and to a mirror finisher. And, but he, he, and the gun came out great. I still have the gun. Yeah. I still have the gun. I will tote that around and give it to my yeah. children and it'll go through our. We'll family. have to show it on here sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely. Yeah, we'll pan it in or whatever. Yeah. Last video. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll dig it out and we'll, we'll go through that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and I had a lens seed oil the stock, you know, and, it, and the stock's a little sticky now because it's old, you know. I mean, that's, we're talking, oh my gosh, four years ago. You yeah. Know? So, um, it, 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 you know, time flies. It's just crazy, you know. But he did teach me those basics that, you know, with, with basic tools and with if you improve your skills and your talent, there's so much you can do. Yeah. And he always wanted to inspire me to keep you know, reaching for that goal. Mm -hmm. And that's why he put those parameters up around me so that I couldn't just like wing it together like an erector set and yeah. start the next one. And and he wanted you to understand what craftsmanship meant. Even though maybe at that age, your level of craftsmanship is down here and not up here, but he still wanted you to know and taste it, what it feels like to produce something with your hands and actually be able to be proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember the first time I went to go work for my old boss when I was a carpenter mm -hmm. and he was telling me to do things and I was like, why the hell am I doing this when I could just do it this way? And then you would look at the end product and it was like not even close to what yeah. it looked like. Yeah, exactly. You know, and um, so that was my start, you know, right there. And um, from that, I, I, I built a couple other guns in, in high school also, like that 6.5 Jap. I brought it back into school. I remade a whole new stock for it and everything. And it would be nothing to see Bob walking down the hallway with a gun case. <laughs> and everybody else would be, and you didn't see kids running and screaming and, you know, teachers wanting to jump on my back or anything. No. Yeah. You just walked through it. Everybody walked through it with their books. It was just. Yeah, I can't even imagine because. When I was in high school, if you had a knife or anything, yeah. I mean, anything that yeah. would, a kitchen knife, they, they would pull you into the principal's office and you'd be suspended. Yeah, no, I know, I know. And, and it was just a different time. I mean, uh, no one, no one even considered to cross a line to hurt somebody yeah. with something like that. Well, there, I, I feel like there's a stigma now against guns and knives and stuff like that as opposed to back then yeah most definitely yeah. yeah i mean back then it was more of a part of the the fiber of of your community you yeah. know what i'm saying not yeah. that it was your community this firearm but it was part of your fiber it was just like you know you lived in this middle class house you went walked in the woods you did this whatever you know you went canoeing whatever it was just part of that thing that yeah you know you you bought a gun you know, and, and, and either you used it for hunting or protection or whatever, but it, most people had a desire to own one at yeah. that time, you know, and to own something that uh, they really liked, you know. It's like even uh, the first shotgun I bought, I remember I was, I got my hunting license, I believe I got my junior hunting license, when I, was, I, I went when I was like 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And I remember I wanted a, it was a Winchester 20A uh, single shot shotgun, and I wanted it so bad. I mean, it's like... 
you just, I did, you know, it's one of those things you just craved and it's like, how am I going to get this gun? And my dad said, you save half the money, I'll pay for the rest of it. Yeah. I mowed grass, I trimmed trees, I did everything I could, you pulled weeds, and I made enough money to go and buy that gun. Mm -hmm. And and that gun, even though it was like $119 or something at that time, it was a single shot, 20 gauge, it was really a nice gun. Yeah. It was steel. It had, you know, a nice detail to the frame. It actually had a nice wood stock. It didn't look like cardboard or plastic. It, yeah. it, and, and you were like, you had, you were inspired to buy it. You know, it was like, wow, I saved my money and I, I, I was proud to buy this and I was proud to own it, you yeah. know, and I took care of it. You cleaned it, you oiled it. Yeah. I mean, I can remember me and friends of mine in high school after we got more and more into guns and and you know getting together uh, in summer break and we're all cleaning our guns and, <laughs> and we're all going out in the woods you know hunting and not even hunting just target shooting in the summer yeah. you know um and uh you know I, I can remember even when we started getting into uh back then like the semi-automatic weapons you know it's like uh uh one of my best friends he bought an ar-15 i bought an m1 carbine and I can remember my, me and my buddy out back loading magazines, and we were probably 17 there, 18, maybe we just started yeah. driving, and my mother yelling at us, because she's like, she's going, do you need that many bullets? And I'm like, the mag ain't full yet, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we'd go out in the woods and just, you know, and no one ever got hurt, no one, you know. No one ever did stupid things. We all took safety courses. You know, we all took the safety courses at the state and everything else um, to get our licenses and that. And and you know, we, we we just grew up around it, so we were more familiar with it. You know, yeah. I think even in today's environment, you know, one of the things that um, I think is real bad, you know, is in if a person is going to have a firearm in the home, uh, you know, that's his own or her own personal choice, which is great. But guess yeah. what? everybody in the house has to understand that's in the house and everybody yeah. in the house has to understand the safety about that yeah okay like i i i can remember you know again in my progression of of being where i am today i, I own gun shops in the past when yeah. i was in my and oh back in you're talking mm, my oh my probably the 80s I started a gun shop, yeah. a couple of them and um, you know we work with the retail and I would see like a husband come in and say oh boy I'm gonna buy this handgun I love it and the wife would be sitting there saying oh you're not gonna let little Johnny see that you're never gonna let Johnny touch that we're never gonna let him <laughs> worse okay yeah you don't want him to touch it I get it should be safely locked away and all those things but guess what your wife anybody of age okay should know how to handle that firearm properly and know yeah. how to safely unload it, make sure it's unloaded, everything else. Yeah. I mean, it's the first thing my, and again, it was one of those things when, when I was growing up, our, our parents taught us those things. Our grandparents taught us those things. We didn't have to, even though we did still go for safety classes and all those things, it was ingrained in your family that, you know, this is the way you lived and you're not going to mistreat this because if you do mistreat this, you're never going to touch it again. You're yeah. not going to have one. Not in this house. Or you don't live in this house. Yeah. That's the way things were in my day. You know, there was there was there was certain there was certain lines that you didn't cross. You know that you know the kids today it seems like they cross certain lines and it's like, oh wow, you know, well let's just take away their Xbox for five days. No, he could have actually seriously hurt somebody himself or somebody in the family. You know, yeah. there has to be some true consequences. You know, and, and and today it's kind of not like that. You know, we'd rather like send him to a shrink and spend six hundred bucks to tell the kid that he did something wrong. You know, yeah. uh, no, back then that happened in your family. That happened in your inner core, and and you learn to respect certain things in a certain way. And you know, maybe certain people will never understand that. Maybe they weren't brought up that way. But but in my family, that's the way things were, and and it was important. You know, to 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 me and everyone else in our family, that everybody knew how to use those firearms. Everybody knew how to check them to make sure they were unloaded. You know, and make sure they were stored safely and kept kept clean and kept oiled. You know, that's yeah. that's the way we treated things back then. Um, today, uh, in some ways, I reflect upon 
you know, I'm 56 years old now, so it's like I, I, I've seen a lot of changes in, in, this, in this country, in this world, and it seems today is more like a disposable world. Yeah. I don't care if you're buying, uh, you know, a gun or a car or a house or, you yeah, know. Yeah, you got upgraded every three, five years. Yeah, phone. Yeah. Your battery's dead in 18 months, so you got to yeah. buy a new phone because you can't <laughs> replace it. You know, all this stuff is not really, it's not really made for you to to, to be too attached to it and pass it through your family and, and make it kind of an heirloom or anything like that, you know. And, and you don't, in, in life itself, how many things do you, do you really see like that, you know. It's, yeah. You might, you, you know, what I've always tell people is uh, no one, you know, unless somebody commits a crime, nobody throws away a gun. No. Nobody throws away a gun. Okay, you might have your, your grandfather or your great-grandfather's old shotgun. It may not even work, but you still got it over the mantle or you kept it because it's a keepsake. Yeah. How many things in mm -hmm. life, you know, maybe your grandmother's old wedding ring or, you know, your grandfather's old watch, you know, there's a few things you might keep sacred to yourself, you know? Yeah. And, and, but other than that, most of life is disposable. Mm -hmm. And it's, in some ways it's okay. In other ways it's kind of sad. Yeah. You know, because some things were meant to be disposable. That orange peel is meant to be disposable. You know, your yeah. family wasn't meant to be disposable. You know, and, and so, the, you know, how do you, how do you grade things on the food chain, I guess, in your life? And, um, so anyway, from, from all those basic attributes and, and, and skills and things that I was taught in the school, you know, from there, I, I, in high school with Mr. Kish, I ended up next moving to uh, Penn State, Williamsport. And um, at that time... It, yeah, Sandusky. Yeah, 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 but that's, that was a whole, we were in a different branch, yeah, a whole different branch, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, call that one, right? That, but it was like, a, at, that, at that time, it was actually Williamsport Area Community College, which was um, part of the Penn State group. But mm -hmm. actually, the year I was graduating, they became Penn State. Mm -hmm. Even when we were there, all the teachers were Penn State's teachers. Yeah. But um, they had a wonderful shop there. And, and you took your, your major, which I took tooling technology, which was machining, CNC programming, heat treating, uh, physics, uh, metallurgy, all those things. That's, that was my bag. And for your machining courses, you, uh, four hours a day, every day you went to that. Yeah. And, that, and then after that, at night, you had to go to all the other classes. You know, me, I can't, couldn't stand things like English comps and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yeah, we're the same in that regard. Yeah, I hated English. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I give me a block of metal, I'll go and have fun with it. But I don't want to read, you know, any of this other stuff, yeah. and poetry and all this stuff. I'm like, well, you know, I don't get it, don't like it, never gonna like it. You know, it's yeah. like, but you know, you had to do it. And so it was part of rounding off your sharp edges, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. so so from there. Um, I went through college there, and, and it was really good. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad I had supportive parents, and they, they wanted me to go through and, and get that done. And I learned a lot of skills there. Um, also, I took night courses, extra night courses on more programming and things of that nature. Yeah. And, and it really accelerated me to what I wanted to do in the future. But again, the passion for firearms still was that, that little token out in front of me that I kept yeah. following. And... Uh, it, like I wouldn't have gone to Mr. Kish's class. I wouldn't have gone to this college if it wasn't for that passion. Um, and out of out of college, I did. I, I I did not follow firearms. Okay, I did have a, a firearm store when I got out of college, um, but I I really I, I I got hired by IBM. I worked mm -hmm. as a as a tool maker. I went into an apprenticeship there, which okay. also was probably one of the best things I ever did. Because the apprenticeship to become a journeyman uh, just also just sharpened your skills so much more. Yeah. You know, like when I talk to people who are trying to design parts and they're talking about tenths or they're talking about thousands or they're talking about heat treatments, most people are like they're like a thousands. Well, what's that? And and yeah. you know they don't understand what it even is physically. Yeah. You know, when I can say, well, take a hair off your head, split it eight times, that's like a thousand. Yeah. You're like, well, I can't yeah, I, see that. I remember the first time you told me what a thousand was. And yeah. Like, I was reading the calipers, and I, 
it was like learning a whole new language coming from a tape measure. Exactly. Exactly. It's like a whole different world uh, yeah. that you step into. And, you know, like most people, uh, I'll give you an example, um, the metric system. You know, again, I'm not much for the metric system. I get it. I, I understand it. I, I, don't, I, I work with it every day. I don't love it. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of foreign to us. Okay. But uh, one thing in, in, a, in, in a, one of my teachers at Penn State told me, he said, it's going to be really tough for everybody to really grasp the metric system. And I, I said, why? And he said, because physically we can't relate to anything. Our whole life has been built around a gallon, not a liter, you know, or an inch, not a centimeter. Yeah. And, and, and I started thinking, he goes, well, just think of this. He says, if I tell you, show me what a gallon of milk looks like, you can visualize that in your head. Yeah. But if I say, what's two and a half liters of milk? You can't really visualize it. Yeah. You don't know if you're getting ripped off, you're getting more, you're getting less, you're getting, you're, you know. Yeah. So, and again, if you were on the other side of the planet where that's all they had was a metric system, they feel probably totally opposite. Yeah. <laughs> they look around. Exactly. So, again, it's just a whole different deal. And when we got into the apprenticeship, it, you know, it was very refined. And they had, you know, part of our day was working on the regular floor. Mm -hmm. Part, and then the next part of our day was actually working on projects that we had to do. And the next, in the evenings, we had to go to night classes and take trigonometry, programming, all this other stuff, CAD design, um, three-dimensional design, all these things yeah. with, with, other, with other teachers that would come in and teach us. And it was restricted to 10 people a year. Mm -hmm. So I felt real fortunate to be part of that, you know? Um, and I, I, I'll get a minute, I'm just gonna go grab you. I wanna show something yeah. to you. I'm, I'm pretty, out there, there's uh, my, my Gershner toolbox, which was my, my present when I, when I was a journeyman. That right there is my block. And people will say, what the hell is that? And what that is, okay, is a one inch block that you had to have, it, they gave you a big chunk of cast iron. Yeah. And you had to file that, they gave you files, and you had to file that, and it had to be square, parallel, and mic within one thousandth of an inch everywhere. I've actually seen these people sell blocks, blocks like this just just because of this. Yeah, that's crazy. and you see the punch marks. Yeah. Every time you got a side done, you had to take it to the instructor. He would inspect it and he would put a punch on that side. Now, if you screwed up, you had to take all the sides down a sixteenth of an inch again. So I felt really proud because it was only me and one other guy that got it at one inch. And I took, okay, in a, in a lot of people say, well, all right, did you get that done before launch? Did, no. You know how many hours I have on that guess? I'd say, uh, I'd say two days. 38 hours. That's crazy. I, so, had, so I you were never hand filing this. Hand filing it. I will never forget that. I will never forget making that block. And then you'll see, what after your block was done, and you see there's a little bit of rust spot here, and that's where they put the electrode. They take it down the chrome plating, and they would dip it in the chrome plane, uh, plating tank and chrome mm -hmm. plate it. But that's what those little marks are all the way around there. Every time mm -hmm. you reach the milestone on the side, they would, <clears throat> they would mark it with there. that punch. I don't know if they can see this, but there's little punches right there, and then he even has his initials scribed in there. Yeah, you, you scribe your initials yeah. on it. That's one inch all the way around. Yeah, and not and it's not just an inch. It's making it an inch and keeping it square and parallel within a thousandths all yeah. the way around. And what what they did this for was two things. One, you came out of college and you were a hot rod. You know, you, you're like a wild stallion and you're like, man, I can kick everybody's ass and I'm gonna do whatever. This breaks you. Yeah. This breaks you down to like, oh my gosh. And, and they give you cast iron. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody has ever filed cast iron before, but it's dirty and your hands are like pitch black when you finish it. <laughs> and they got so all over you. And they would give you the nastiest crap to work with, but they did it for a reason. Yeah. And they did it to teach you that number one, you got to take time if you want to make it right. Mm -hmm. And and again, it was an accomplishment. And like a lot of people, if they found this laying in the street, they throw it out. They say, oh, what is this piece, piece of junk here? I got this block. What is it doing here? 
but this block I'll take to my grave, man, because yeah. it meant so much to me. And to be able to file that by hand, one inch square, one inch parallel, and one inch in dimensional accuracy to a yeah. thousands all around. And it also taught you that you and your hands and your mind can do amazing things. Yeah. Amazing I things. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, these are things that people would be like, you would think you'd have to grind it yeah. or, or you'd have to mill it. And like, no, you did this with a file. Yeah. And, and it taught you something. It taught you that you have more, I, and I, I don't want to say power, but you have, I, I, I'm having a hard time even expressing it, but. More ability. More, more ability in your hands. You have yeah. just as much ability in your hands, in your mind, if you use it properly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. If I, if, if I had to sell this block, like to, to most people it's worth about four cents in scrap metal. To yeah. me it's worth thousands. Yeah of what it is yeah so it's it's just again and, and a lot of people who are journeymen how to do something like this not everybody but there there there's quite a few people that have had to do a block like this some people do journeymen's and like i i at one time started out in a state program for a journeyman and basically all it was was logging hours on different equipment and mm -hmm. you have your boss sign it and off you go yeah. this was a like regimented class Everybody yeah. had to get through certain milestones. <clears throat> if you didn't, you weren't going to be in the class. Yeah. So it it, it was it was uh, you know a great thing and and it, it really taught you a lot. So I guess what I take from this is one that your own human ability is it can be a lot more than what you think it is. Number yeah. one, <clears throat> and number two, it it, it shows your patience. Um, and, and it also shows you again, like what you can do if you just take your time and if you really have that passion to do something right, you yeah. know. So it, it's just a, and we had a bunch of other projects we had to do. We had some projects that had to be within uh, under a tenth and square and everything, and we had to use a drill press and a grinder, like crazy stuff that you would never think you could do. We had yeah. to go like to check a lot of the things that were, you know, in the tents. We actually had a, a clean room and a cold room, which it was all temperature regulated. We had electrolytic gauges, everything to check everything. So it wasn't just making the product, but you were also learning how to use all the equipment around you. And yeah. so to expand your abilities to be the best. <clears throat> so, you know, as I, as I progressed in that job, um, I left the tool room and I was hired in engineering and mm -hmm. I, then I was a mechanical engineer. Uh, high-speed impact printers basically and top yeah. matrix heads things like that I did all types of things and did a lot of analytic uh, items of like failure rates and all those type of things yeah <clears throat> and it was a great job and there was a lot of good people there but I felt as I I still had a huge passion for firearms number one yeah and I also <laughs> felt that in the big corporate structure I was being held back and I always felt smothered yeah. And, you know, I can remember telling my, my wife, I said, you know, I, uh, worst part of my day is turning the door handle to get in there because yeah. <laughs> it's actually my job's easy. I, I, yeah. you know, I could, and I said, and then I look at some of these old guys in there that they run the coffee machine half the day and I, I can't see myself doing that. Yeah. Sitting at a desk all day. And, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, so I got to the point where I just said, I, I, I think I'm going to leave. I had an opportunity to buy into a machine shop, which I did. And and then from there, it, it, I left the bigger company. I went into this machine shop. I got that going, you know, fairly decent. And then uh, from that transition, I ended up uh, purchasing Dan Wesson mm -hmm. out of bankruptcy at one time. Yeah. Uh, moved them from Massachusetts to New York State, try to rekindle that, that project. Um, and then that passed on to CZ, and they're taking care of it great, doing yeah. a great job with it. Um, and then I also, at that same time when I bought Dan Wesson, I owned Wildy Firearms, which, uh, the big 475 Wildy and those things. And I worked with Will Moore and Will Moore was a great, uh, great engineer. I mean, he was, he was phenomenal of, uh, um, like looking at like what's next, what can you do next how to, how, in the, in the industry. Yeah. Um, and I worked with him for a while, and then and then basically I sold that company back to a group uh, 
because they didn't really want to move from Connecticut down to New York and I couldn't do everything at the same time. It's just your capacity is only so much. So they, they ended up, you know, going back and working with another group up there, which was fine. Yeah. Um, and, and we did that. And, and then my, my progression um, went to creating uh, Fusion. And I, I did also work engineering for some other companies. I worked on uh, synchrotrons, which I don't know if you know what that is, but it's uh, like a mile long tunnel and underground yeah. and where they take um, x-rays of atoms and everything. And I would- um, Yeah, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen videos of those things. Yeah, I used to, I worked on the, I did all the mechanical magnetos, magnets to make the energy whip and go faster and faster and faster until you could actually make a x-ray of an atom or something. I mean, I, didn't even understand all the physics behind it, yeah. but I could understand the mechanics very well, and yeah. so I was the guy who built a lot of that stuff, and it was, it was like Star Wars for me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And, I mean, and, and it opened my eyes to a lot of things that I didn't even know existed, yeah. or even know like, you know, they, they they put like some photographic paper up and get this X-ray, and I'd look at it and be like spots and they're like well you're looking at an x-ray of an atom and i'm like yeah that's insane because that's <laughs> the molecules I mean, the molecules yeah. of an atom so you know and, and so i did that for a little while and also i was i was building fusion at the same time and then once fusion got to the point where i could take it to the next step i moved on and just did that full time yeah and then our progression from from new york um which you know everyone knows is in a very gun-friendly state yeah, and social yeah, for the most part, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. And, and uh, you know, again, that changed dramatically. When I first moved to New York uh, uh, with IBM, it was farmland. It was pretty much uh, open territory. It was just very, very easy to live, nice area. Yeah. And as mm -hmm. everything went more liberal, the taxes went crazy, the services went worse, the everything you know it's just the yeah. whole area now has just depleted if you want to call it and it's sad because you go back and you look at some of the really beautiful towns that used to be flourishing and you know growing and they're just imploding you know yeah. and i remember when we went up there um was that last year or the year before that yeah. and there was i mean it, it seemed like everything was boarded up a lot, yeah the, a lot of the bigger towns that used to be really uh vibrant and and doing well yeah. are boarded up a lot of it and just run down and it's sad because it's it's and and you would think as things got worse the tax structure would go in reverse and it hadn't it's just yeah. gotten worse and people can't afford you know to really do what they do yeah. to keep their communities clean and keep things decent and to have decent jobs there you know yeah and and so you know again i didn't really see a future there anymore you know and also with all the political forces uh, and factors there it was time just to look at better ground and yeah. my parents live in florida and it, they've lived here for well, now about 14 years or so and um i just decided yeah man we're we're uh, i'm moving south yeah <laughs> I'm gonna look for greener pastures. Yeah, you know? better weather. Yeah, better weather. I don't want to scrape windows, and that was part of it too. You yeah. know, I, I got to the point where I, I'm like, man, I, I am not waking up scraping windows anymore. <laughs> I am not gonna be slipping and sliding on this ice and crap to work anymore, <laughs> and running into potholes. I'm just not gonna do it. And, yeah. and so, you know, I, I got to a breaking point where I just said, okay, we're gonna make the jump. And and Florida has been a progression from us, you know, actually moving into a building and just kind of. Uh, established we're trying to reestablish ourselves and now we bought a building where we, we you know we're, we're bought more CNC equipment um, we're growing expanding our product line you know mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not just all me I mean you know the some of the greatest things is just having your family with you it really yeah. is because you know it, it's like we all work together you know to make it better and sometimes it's tough you know I mean there's there's always I don't you know I don't care where you come from there's conflicts at times and families oh, yeah. it just especially happens. when you're with each other all the time yeah That's yeah how it goes yeah and but i mean when it overall i wouldn't trade it for anything because you know i can see the progression i can see the growth in people um and again it's it's not just that but it's the growth of the of the of the trade in the industry because it is a dying trade you yeah. know i mean 
uh, most you don't you see very few custom gunsmiths anymore. There are some out there, and there's some yeah. there's some wonderful custom gunsmiths out there. It really is. Uh, but if I look at 20, 30 years ago, the amount of custom gunsmiths there were, mm -hmm. and then today, it, it, it it's changed. Yeah. You know where there's less and less people with like true mechanical abilities, um, and there's more and more just like parts replacers. Yeah. Or, I'm gonna buy this whiz bag and I'm gonna bolt on this rail and I'm gonna put some fat pins in there and I think I got a good gun. You know, it's it's yeah. it's it's changed. You know, and uh, um, and some people like that. Some people just like doing the maintenance in, in those type of things, which is great. You know, that to me, I I do like figuring out problems. I do like making something better. Always. I mean, I've always been. That's always you know pulled me in that direction and in the positive direction. But yeah. Um, but. Uh, it, there's less and less hands-on anymore. Yeah. And I think we see that everywhere. It's not just in the gunsmithing industry. It's in, you know, look how a car is assembled anymore. It's all done by robotics for the most part now yeah. and that instead of people on the line assembling them. Yeah. You know, like welding a car. I don't think there's any people even welding a car anymore. It's all done by robots. Yeah. And so, and again, that's all progression to produce pretty much a production product. And that's it. You know, it, it's like there's, and when you when you buy a production product, it is what it is. When it comes out of the box, and it's hard to really make it much, much more. You know. Yeah. And that, and, and years ago, you know, like even our cars. You know, you'd buy a '69 Camaro or something, and man, you could suit that thing up to be like unbelievable. My my grandpa still has a Chevelle SS. I mean, he's he's a mechanic, mm -hmm. and he bought a brand new Chevelle SS. In 1969, he's the one owner, and it's still, I mean, pristine condition. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that is it's awesome. a sweet car. And, and uh, those were cars that they were built so the guy could work on them. Yeah. Like, you buy a car now, and it's, like, so computerized and so... Oh, yeah. Well, to even figure out what you need, you have to take it to a shop, and they hook it up to a computer because yeah. it's just, like, a sensor or something yeah. like that. And even, like, basic repairs. You know, like, I had a have a water pump replaced on my wife's car. You know, and it's like, oh, we gotta take the whole nose of the car off. <laughs> I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> it, it's like, who would design yeah, something like this? That's wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's just crazy stuff like that, you know? And so, yeah, production items have progressed so that they can produce higher quantities at lower cost. Mm -hmm. And there has been armies of engineers and bean counters to sit there and make that happen. Yeah. So they sit there and say, well, if we tweak this, we're saving this much money. If we tweak this, we're saving this much money. So, okay, if you bought a car in 1969 and, it, and your life expectancy for that car was 10 years, today you buy a car and they say, well, let's just get it past the lease. <laughs> you know? Past, past the warranty. <laughs> you, yeah. know? you know, just like your phones. You know, a lot of people, it's like, well, I love this phone. It's got all these new gadgets and gizmos. Yeah, but now you can't even replace the battery. In it. So why, yeah. what do you do with it? You can't even replace a battery. Yeah. So, you know, and I get it. You know, they're trying to make more stuff disposable, but that is not our vision for fusion, and yeah. that's not our vision for for taking the 1911, yeah. and 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 it's not our vision for taking the firearms. And you know, the 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 the, the more produ higher production type firearms, they're fine for a lot of people. You know, there there yeah. some people that's all they want. They're just looking for. They're not looking for a target gun. They're just looking for something for yeah. protection. They're just looking for something to throw in their truck. They're, they're looking to just go out and shoot tin cans. You know, that's... Well, and I think what's crazy, too, is, though, is that, like, our our line, that the Freedom Series, you pay, like, an extra 150 200 bucks, and you got yourself an all-steel constructed gun. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, you know we, 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 and it's all upgradable. Yeah. Everything we produce here, we try to make it so it's it's standard 70 series, okay, uh, Colt, Colt 70 series, and it's upgradable. So the sight cuts are upgradable, the, the, the thumb safeties are upgradable, the springs are easily upgradable, and no matter what you want trigger groups, no matter what you want in that gun in the future, you can make it into that Yeah. because it's all pretty standard 1911. Yeah. A lot of stuff that you're getting anymore these days it's not standard anything. 
it's it's you got all types of weird you know it's got different safety parts in it it's got you know which some people say they're safeties which in another video we'll go over all the safeties in a 1911 it's already got four or five safeties you don't really need another one yeah <clears throat> some of the safety features that are put in firearms today are from rulings that bigger companies signed with some of the anti-gun groups years and years ago and they're yeah. still being brought forward because you'll look at a gun and you'll say why did they put that in that gun well because they signed these contracts years ago and they're still <laughs> active yeah why can't they give me a three three and a half pound trigger pull because they signed these contracts and they can't yeah. you know they, they did some things years ago when everybody was getting crazy about um, a lot of the civil suits that were in the industry mm -hmm. and and I can understand um, why I get it but again we weren't involved with that so we didn't follow that path yeah um, but again we try to make the gun uh, so in the pistol so it's special for people yeah and, and we want people just like that that shotgun when I when I first bought it and I really wanted it and I was so inspired to buy it I want people when they come in and they look at the fusion line and they say wow you know that's that's just a beautiful gun got nice coca bowl grips it's all steel there's some beautiful top serrations somebody put some actual hand talent into this beaver tails blended the back here is blended and it, wow it's only it's only $8.99 yeah you know I so we try to add those little touches you know and some people will never notice it you know yeah. and and I and I get that you know it's like some people again it's just a tool it's like buying a hammer yeah um, but for other people you know they want to own something a little bit more special or maybe they say well yeah, that's a great base gun for me and I hope someday I can I can move on and and you know I want to I want to use it for some type of target practice. I want to use it for action shooting. I'd like to actually do this and this to the gun. You can do it to these guns. It's not yeah. a problem. It's not you know um, they don't have weird sight cuts on them. They don't have uh, you know different type of trigger control systems, transfer bar systems, uh, um, you know all those type of things that just make it a mayhem. You know, yeah. um, like even a lot of the polymers it's easy to field strip the tops. They all use the same basic field stripping for the tops, but try to go into the bottom where yeah. you've got torsion springs and all this other stuff in there. And it's just like, oh my gosh, how do they get this thing together? And then you got to use slave pins to put it together and all these things. The 1911 is really basic and simple. And, and, a, and as we go through more of these videos going forward, we'll start stripping them down and showing people how to do certain things. And in my life it's time that i want to pass this stuff on to other people who want to learn it um again the industry for the for the for the true custom builders getting smaller and smaller and smaller and yeah i still would like to see an archive out there that so people can understand the proper ways of doing things and that just like this block you know you can do a lot of it by hand yeah and you, you you know yes in our manufacturing we do use a lot of precision equipment we use surface grinders we use CNC machines we have mill turn centers uh, horizontal mills all these things but when it comes right down to you at home how do you get from point A to point B yeah for what you desire in that product so uh, you know a lot of our future videos going forward are going to be like this you know like how do we how do we change sites how do we upgrade a trigger group you know yeah and 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 what's fun is that we you know we have a, a, a huge following of customers and a lot of loyal customers have been purchasing parts and, and guns and custom builds from us for years you know we have families that have I got I got people that have bought in 13 14 custom builds from me yeah you know and, and they just they just are inspired by what we, the craft by the art of what it is mm -hmm. um, and you know again I want to hopefully be able to help other people to be able to do that also as we move forward yeah. um, and some people they want to do it all themselves and other people they'll take it so far and they'll call us and they'll say hey I want to send it in because I want you guys to put vent cuts in the slide and I want you to I, you know it's way above me to install the barrel so I'd like you guys to fit a new match barrel in there and I want a ramp yeah. barrel uh, you know so they'll take it to a certain point and then sometimes they'll do it them all themselves or they'll send it back to us you know that type of thing. Yeah well so. what's great is that they can buy build kits too if they're exactly. right in the middle too yeah. right yeah and we offer a bunch of different build kits and and again we're going to do a future video on build kits and, mm -hmm. and 
what's going to what's in them you know and it's like for your beginner kits our freedom series kits are wonderful yeah. most of the stuff's already pre-fit for you it's very easy assembly you you can learn how the parts react how the parts work together things like that uh the pro series kits they're more custom yeah. and they're all over the map you know we get a lot of people that email us i want a pro series kit um what do you offer and it's like yeah what do you want you know <laughs> and it, it's so, so we try to offer you what you want. They'll come in and say, oh, I want a 5-inch gun, I want a tactical rail, I want a magwell, I want, you know, this finish eventually and things like that. And then we kind of work with the customer back and forth on a bill of materials on how we're going to achieve that. Yeah. So, it, you know, we'll go over those in some other videos of the kits and the builds and everything else. Um, yeah. But again, it's it's. I feel that, I, I hope that we can inspire people to, to you know, safely build these guns and be able to build them for themselves there's a lot of pride that's taken into that it's just like yeah you know your, your grandfather with that car yeah there's a lot of pride in it yeah he loves that car yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i i remember my, my grandfather had a what was it a 67 nova mm -hmm. and he went every sunday out there waxing and polishing that car you know yeah. it, it, it's like it, it, there became such a respect for something that you really enjoyed you yeah. know and um so you know we want to put that same same type of feel into into our guns and uh, and if some like I said some people come in they have us build the whole gun for them spec it out that's fine other people start at one position and then want to upgrade it as they go you yeah. know and we don't just do fusions here I mean we upgrade Kimbers Dan Wessons Wilsons you name it you know it, it, we 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 uh, rebuild all that stuff here. Um, and you know my education going through is more hands-on even though i went to engineering school they didn't teach you much about guns there yeah very little you know um but the the through my life i worked with a lot of people out there that were big in the industry um you know dave skinner who just recently passed away from sti uh, i worked with you know mr nolan you know on some projects with barrels frames and slides yeah. um the original mr clark um, I worked with him at times uh, down at his ranch um, yeah. and his shooting range um, and we had a lot of like all these people were bedrocks in the 1911s you yeah. know they really were um, and um, they all we all had like real casual talks about things mm -hmm. I mean just sitting down I, I can remember going out from at Mr. Clark's um, uh, from his bunkhouse actually I was staying on his property by the range and I went walking out in the morning just to take a walk real early in the morning remember that the fog was just coming off of their range and here he came walking out of the woods <laughs> and he was just walking in the woods and stuff and me and him sat and we talked for a long time about the 1911 and things that were really necessary things that weren't really necessary things that people overblow too far you know yeah. <clears throat> to really build a good gun and <clears throat> and again, it, it's all on people's what they want for their end result, what their budget is, and, and how do you want to get there. The thing that's good about using a, a, a standard 70 series model for a base is that no matter what you start with, as long as it's got a decent quality frame slide, okay, you can move on to build it up to whatever you really want in the future. Yeah. You know, you're not stuck. You're not stuck to where, okay, well, how do I do this? Oh, I gotta send it away to this to have it done. No, you can do it at home if you got a few basic tools. Yeah. Um, you know, or if you, you know, some people just aren't handy. Some people aren't mechanical. They just want to send it away, which is yeah. fine. You know. But again, <clears throat> by educating people like this, it's I think it will show them a lot of different things, not just as what the 1911 is and where you can start from, where you can go to but also inspire people that there's all these different features and there's all these different applications for different parts. And because everybody has a different vision for that gun. Yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, I, I want a good hunting pistol. I, I want a good target pistol. Uh, you know, I want a defensive pistol. I want a pistol I just throw in my truck because I want one on the farm. You know, there, there's all these different reasons. Some people are just collectors. Yeah, I want to collect one. I want my badge number on it because I'm retiring this year. So again, how do we get your project to that point? And that's that's what we we try to achieve and work with people on. So, um, 
But yeah, I mean, I, I, I encourage anybody that got questions or need help, just call in or email us through our customer support on the, the website. And yeah. We're there to help. And then also, uh, if you guys have any questions, you can comment, and we're going to do videos based on your questions. So anyone that has a question, just leave it down in the comments, and we'll get back with you. So thanks for watching our video, and have a great day. Thank you.